Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second part of our What's Bugging You webinar in our Beef Brunch educational series. My name is Ashley Edwards, and I am an assistant extension agent and coordinator of animal science programs for the LSU Ag Center. I will be hosting today with the help of Vince Desitel. Vince is a livestock agent and beef cattle coordinator in the central region. Today's speaker is Jason Holmes. Jason is a livestock specialist and agent in the Northeast region. He will be discussing management practices for identifying and controlling external parasites in livestock. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We will be muting all of your microphones. We ask that you please keep them muted throughout the webinar. If you are joining us online via the Teams app or the link, you can enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. If you are calling in, you may text your questions to me. My number is 512-818-5476. Again, if you're calling in and you cannot see our screen or access the Q&A box, you can send me a text with your questions. My number is 512-818-5476. Five, four, seven, six. In the interest of time, we will wait to answer all of the questions until the end of the presentation. We also ask that you please be patient with us if we experience any technical difficulties as we are still learning to navigate through these live events in Microsoft Teams. With that, I would like to turn it over to Jason to get us started. Uh, Jason, don't forget to please unmute your microphone. All right, thank you, Ashley, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, this has been quite an unusual uh, spring that we've had uh, in multiple ways, and uh, um, fly problems have, uh, have been no different. Uh, they, uh, they are certainly giving us some, some pretty major issues in, in areas around the state, so we thought it would be a good opportunity to to visit about uh, external parasites, particularly fly control uh, for our beef cattle uh, producers and, and try to try to do it from a most economical approach as possible. Uh, so what we're going to discuss today is uh, just in terms of an overview, the impact and control methods that are available out there. Uh, the, the flies that we're going to focus on, uh, the most important economical flies, the horn fly and the stable fly, will be where we'll spend most of our time. Um, uh, the horse fly and deer fly can also be some periodic pest, and then the black fly, the buffalo gnat, uh, can also be uh, some of those periodic pests that we have out there and can be, can be an issue for us. But uh, we'll spend most of our time talking about horn fly and stable fly, the impacts that they have on our beef cattle herds, uh, and also the control methods that are out there for us. Uh, the, the diagram that you have there on the slide uh, gives us a good indication of where we can expect to see some of these flies present on the animal at any given time. Uh, and those will be important to us as we move through some of this. Uh, in terms of uh, proper identification and just being effective in terms of the, uh, the control methods that we try to put in place on our herd. So impact of external parasites. So whenever we're talking about some of these blood sucking fly pests, the horn fly, the stable fly, and many species of tabinets. So those tabinets would be the deer fly and the horse fly. Uh, they are a uh, major pest to us. Some of them can be uh, continuous pests all season long, like the horn fly, the stable fly. And some of them could be periodic, uh, similar to the tabinets, the black flies, uh, and even mosquitoes. I mean, we're not going to tackle mosquitoes today. I think uh, we've got enough interest out there. We can certainly get uh, some of our entomologists to uh, to provide us a talk on, on mosquitoes. We're not going to tackle that one today, but that one also can be a a major pest to us in certain parts of the state. So when we talk about these blood sucking pests, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a contributed blood loss that's associated to it. Uh, but whenever we really start talking about economics importance and in terms of how they are affecting our pocketbook, uh, that is through annoyances which, uh, which alter the normal grazing behavior of the cattle. Uh, and also through weight loss or weight reduced weight gains in our growing cattle, like our um, 
our calves that are still on the cow, uh, wean calves, stalker cattle, yearling cattle, um, whenever we cannot get the appropriate weight gains uh, that we need, um, then um, um, then we can certainly start having some issues there in terms of economic losses. And also the expenditures for the fly control methods that we put into place uh, can also have an impact on those uh, on the economics of, um, of fly control. So the biology of these pests uh, do consider um, do vary considerably, uh, and the uh, it's important for us to know uh, what the biology is because that can have a direct effect on the control methods that we use. Uh, whether that control method is um, biological or cultural uh, or chemical, whatever that method may be, uh, it's important for us to understand that biology, uh, where are they laying eggs at. Um, and those, those are the types of things that are going to be important to us as we start trying to formulate um, an integrated pest management plan to combat these fly pests. So again, understanding that biology, uh, more importantly or more specifically, the life cycle. Uh, so if we understand those, uh, then we can be more effective in, in formulating a good fly control program. Uh, so last week, Dr. Brown talked about uh, army worm control and uh, the importance of going out there and scouting and understanding the different stages of that life cycle uh, from egg production uh, all the way up through a mature worm. That's no different than whenever we're going out there and we're trying to formulate a plan for uh, external parasites or flies on cattle. Uh, we've got to have a good understanding of, uh, of what the life cycle and the biology of the pest is before we can be really effective at formulating a control program. Uh, so like I said a while ago, an integrated approach, uh, that integrated pest management approach, um, what we're talking about there, uh, excellent control may be uh, required to have a multimodal or um, a multi-approach in terms of good effective long-term fly control. Um, most of the time in Louisiana, just because of the environment that we have uh, and the optimal growing conditions that we have for some of these fly pests, it does take that multimodal approach in order to provide that good effective long-term fly control. Um, we've got a lot of good measures out there that we can use for short-term fly control, um, but uh, whenever they're only lasting us uh, three to four weeks, then, uh, then that can be an issue for us in terms of labor, in terms of just cost of products. Uh, so we've got to take that into consideration. So uh, with anything that we do in extension, uh, whenever we start talking about using chemical control measures, uh, any type of pesticide, uh, it is vital that you read and follow that pesticide label. Um, that pesticide label for what we're talking about today could be on a spray, it could be on a ear tag, uh, it could be on a back rubber product. Uh, all of those are going to have chemicals in them uh, and as part of the law they're going to have a label that's attached to it and it's important for you to read and follow that label um, to make sure, number one, that you're within the letter of the law, but number two, that you're optimizing the dollars that you have spent on that product uh, and that you're, uh, you're using it the way the manufacturer uh, claims that it will work in a manner that it will work uh, in order to, uh, to make sure that you're, you're getting the bang for your buck. So the different controlling uh, measures that we have out there, uh, the ones that we're going to look at, non-chemical um, and then chemical. So under the non-chemical methods there, the biological control, I've got fire ants, parasitic wasps, dung beetles uh, listed. So um, you know, we know in Louisiana we have no issue growing fire ants. Uh, fire ants are a natural enemy uh, of these uh, fly larvae. Um, the downside of that is we all understand the other nuisances and the other problems that fire ants can create for us, um, but uh, they are definitely uh, a natural enemy of those uh, of a lot of those fly species. So parasitic wasp, 
um, uh, they uh, they are a a very viable option for us uh, in terms of controlling some of these these fly species. Um, uh, locally, there is not a uh, a good bit of resources for those parasitic wasps. You can get online uh, one that uh, that. I know several folks in Louisiana have had success with is Spalding Labs. Um, they will uh, they'll provide those wasps to you, have an excellent buying experience. So that's just one option for you. Uh, it can get costly. Um, it would be comparable in cost um, to the one-time purchase of ear tags, but uh, you got to apply that over several months. So it could be up to um, uh, four to five dollars per cow per month. Um, we can expect a cost related to fly tags of five dollars per cow, but uh, that would be for um, three to five months of control. So it could get quite costly to to incorporate some of those parasitic wasps. And then the dung beetle. Uh, there is a, there is some uh, university research out there that shows that the dung beetles uh, can be a proven natural predator. Uh, for some uh, for horn fly control because of uh, the fact that the horn fly lays their eggs in fresh manure pats, uh, that that dung beetle, dung beetle can be a, a, a viable pest out there, natural uh, occurring pest that can control that. Cultural methods, management methods such as rotating or dragging pastures, uh, rotating pastures, dragging pastures, so rotating pastures trying to prevent a manure, a manure buildup and dragging pastures so that we can uh, get that man manure out into uh, thin layers across the pastures, which will help us in terms of horn fly control, uh, manure removing manure and wet decomposing hay. Uh, so as we go through this, you'll learn that the stable fly, which is another one of our major economic pests, lays its egg in that, uh, uh, the, there's eggs in that decaying uh, uh, organic matter old hay feeding areas. Uh, if you've got cattle in confinement, um, that uh, that decaying manure and hay and all of that um, um, is where that stable fly is going to lay its eggs. So removing a lot of that uh, that decaying organic matter, uh, you can also um, cut down on the on the environment or the that optimal environment where that uh, that particular fly wants to lay its eggs at and congregate at. And then chemical control, uh, so insecticides, uh, topical, uh, they can be oral, so uh, we're talking about pyrethroids, microcyclic lactones, and organophosphates. Uh, so our, um, our pyrethroids, uh, they can be in the form of ear tags, pour on sprays, rubs, dust, and formulations for pour ons from 0.5% up to 10%, and spray and rub formulations from 1% up to 40% uh, in terms of those pyrethroid products. So those can be cyflutins, permethrins, negative cypermethrins, lambdicides. Uh, those are the ones that we hear most often. Uh, the microcyclic lactones can be in the forms of ear tags and porons. Uh, so those can be uh, like abomectins, so the uh, the popular uh, remote delivery capsules that uh, that you can get through a vet gun applications. They're going to have abomectins, uh, XP820 tags, Trizat tags would be examples of those abomectins. Uh, the ivermectins, uh, that would be ivermec, um, uh, delivered through a pour on or an injectable. Uh, so anytime we use the ivermectins, uh, we know that there's a 48 day with slaughter withdrawal period. Uh, so again, those are important for you to read and understand and follow the label uh, in terms of these slaughter withdrawal periods. Uh, moxidectin, which would be an example of cydectin. Uh, Dormectin, which would be Dectamax. Again, there's a 45 day withdrawal period associated with Dectamax. And then Epernomectin, if I can get that spit out, which would be Epernex. So that would be uh, uh, the classes that would be associated with your microcyclic lactones. And then organophosphates. Uh, many of these organophosphate uh, products that are available through uh, sprays 
uh, will more than likely have a restricted use pesticide label attached to them uh, just because of the dangers associated with organophosphates. Uh, so these products can also be found in ear tags, sprays, rubs, and dusts. Uh, the dust formulations would range from 1 to 6 percent and the spray formulations from 6 percent up to 50 percent organophosphate. Um, and those would be so some of the common names and those organophosphates that we've heard about for years like diazinon uh, can be found in ear tags, um, uh, dichlorbos, uh, vapona uh, would be an example of that. Uh, Again, there's withdrawal periods. Those are one day withdrawal period associated with that product. Chlorpyrifos, which would be um, found in ear tags. Uh, Comophos, uh, a trade name that's very popular or very well known would be Coral. Uh, and then Fosmet um, would be another organophosphate. Uh, there's three day withdrawal periods, uh, slaughter withdrawal periods related to that product. Uh, again, very popular ones that we hear about quite a bit, see a lot on the store sales. shelves would be Prolate Lintox HD. Uh, and one that uh, we don't see as, as often out there on the store shelves, but Paramite LA uh, would be an example of that Fosmet. Uh, Tetrachlorban Fos uh, would be an example, uh, or an example of that one would be Raybon, which is a feed through larvicide or RayVap, uh, which is a spray. Uh, so again, another example of why it's important for us to read and follow the label. So that RayVap, uh, there is a label uh, restriction on there that is not to be used on Brahmin or Brahmin cross cattle because of hypersensitivity issues that have been associated with, uh, with those cattle. And then we have the orals, uh, the feed throughs. So those can be insect growth regulators or larvicides. Don't confuse the two. Um, so insect growth regulators um, um, are very helpful to us. Um, Diflubenzeron, Justify, Clarify would be some trade names. So you also might be familiar with Diflubenzeron because we also use that in the formulation of Demlin 2L for uh, army worm control. Uh, we can also use that same active ingredient uh, uh, formulated as, uh, um, as a feed through uh, that can help us with some of those um, with, uh, with insect growth regulators or IGRs. Um, and then uh, methoprene, which uh, you might see that in the trade name of Altacid. Um, and you also might see some of these IGRs uh, particularly diphenylbenzeron that are now being combined with permethrins um, uh, as a pour on product. Uh, so uh, that's one of the newer combo treatments that are out there where you can get some IGR action and immediate uh, knockdown action through permethrin in some of these combos. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see in these, uh, these chemical formulations that, uh, that you'll see uh, an inert ingredient of uh, piperonyl butoxide. Uh, that's a synergist, so it increases the toxicity of the effectiveness of the, the chemical that you're using. You will see that product a good deal on a lot of these, um, a lot of these chemical products. Uh, sprays, ear tags, many of them will have that inert ingredient in there, which increases the effectiveness of that, of that particular pesticide. Um, and again, uh, just I cannot stress enough that anytime we're dealing with these food animals, uh, it's important to, to pay close attention to those slaughter withdrawals and how that may affect you and your particular situation. Uh, so just make sure that you read and follow those, uh, follow those label directions. So whenever we get into uh, um, talking about some of these um, particular fly pests, we talk about economic uh, thresholds. Um, so uh, we know that uh, with the uh, the horn fly that we're talking about an economic threshold, 250, 200, 250 flies per side. Uh, we know through research uh, that whenever we do exceed that threshold, that economic threshold with these horn flies that we can start seeing calf weight loss of 
um, um, up to 1.10 uh, pounds per day. And then these stocker weights of 0.2 pounds per day. And anytime we start talking about decreased um, weight gain or weight loss, uh, we know that directly correlates to us in an industry where we're trying to put pounds on trailers, uh, we have lost revenue. Um, so anytime we exceed that threshold, uh, we know that we're going to be suffering uh, an economic loss. Uh, so the reason we incorporate uh, control measures, whatever control measure you may choose to use on your operation, the reason that we do that is for economic reasons. Uh, we're trying to uh, increase weight gain or get optimal weight gain, and we're trying not to suffer from weight loss. So uh, just a, um, a, good, a good picture here uh, from Dr. Jason Banta over at Texas A&M Overton. Uh, so that's a, an approximately 197 flies there on the side. Uh, so my good friend Lee Falk, I don't think he's on with us today, but uh, has spent a good bit of time at the Hill Farm back in the day counting flies. Uh, it's a very challenging job, but uh, a good rule of thumb for you in terms of um, uh, estimating uh, horn flies on the side. So if you get a an area on that animal about the size of an eight inch pie plate that is covered in horn flies, uh, you know that you're probably getting real close to that, that economic threshold of 200, 250 flies per side. Uh, so it's important for us to understand what that looks like so we know that whenever we are getting to that economic threshold, it's time to, uh, to incorporate uh, some sort of uh, control measure. So this would be a good example. I mean, uh, we would assume just by looking at the uh, the number of flies that are present there in that picture, uh, whenever they uh, um, uh, those horn flies will get up and swarm, uh, and then they'll come back and rest on the animal. Uh, when we see these type of swarms, we're probably pretty sure that we need to uh, start incorporating some control measures. So uh, insecticide impregnated ear tags, um, uh, very, very common uh, for control of these fly pests. Um, convenience factor, uh, we have, do have to run them through the sheet, but in terms of getting some long-term uh, long residual uh, control of these fly pests, we know that, uh, that we can use and have have a decent amount of success with using these fly tags. Active ingredients that uh, that are out there that fall in the five broad chemical categories, so the pyrethroids, the organophosphates, the macrocyclic lactones, and then we have combos of pyrethroid and organophosphate or pyrethroid and macrocyclic lactones. So uh, we have the basic pyrethroid organophosphate macrocyclic lactones, but then we have can have some combos of those as well impregnated into those ear tags. So it's important to remember that uh, we do need to rotate that insecticide class on these tags. So uh, we don't wanna use those pyrethroid tags uh, any more than once every three years. Uh, so we want to incorporate uh, something in the, in the interim of that, but we do not wanna use those pyrethroid tags in order to try to control some of this uh, pyrethroid resistance that we have out there uh, do not incorporate those more than once every three years. And again, it's also important for us to uh, uh, to remember that we need to follow the label instructions in terms of when to remove those tags, when are they no longer effective, when the label recommends or in the fall. Um, it's also important that we, uh, we apply those tags in the proper area. So between that second and third rib of the ear, uh, and about halfway between the ear tip and the head. Um, um, so if you've, if you've done enough tagging, uh, you know what those ribs in the ear look like, uh, what I'm talking about there. So between that second and third rib, and then halfway between the ear tip and the head. Uh, so again, following the label directions in terms of how many to apply. Uh, most labels will tell you um, uh, one to two tags and the mature animals, so one tag in each ear. Uh, but uh, again, follow that label of direction in terms of how many tags to use. Uh, it'll also tell you if that tag is recommended to be used in calves. 
so a lot of them that if you get out there and read the label, it will tell you to apply one tag in the ear of the calf. But it, some of them it will also tell you on the label that you're not supposed to apply it in tags less than three months old uh, for fear of, uh, of getting some ear damage. Uh, so again, read and follow the label directions for these ear tags in terms of how many to put in mature animals uh, for, um, uh, for effective long-term optimal control. And again, read the, uh, the tag label uh, to figure out if you need to put it in uh, the year of the calf and what they recommend in terms of the minimal age that you can put that tag in. So some of the periodic methods that we've got out there, sprays, pour ons, dust, rubs, uh, remote delivery capsules, uh, all of those are what we're talking about in terms of periodic methods. Um, uh, these products are plentiful when it comes to fly control. Um, uh, one thing to keep in mind that the majority of these fly control methods in terms of chemical methods were actually developed for horn fly control. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's helpful to note to it for us that a lot of these that will look at the label, they're going to have horn fly control on there. They do provide good complementary control. Um, again, uh, a lot of them were developed for horn flies. So just a couple of tips here in terms of some of these periodic methods uh, for back rubbers. It's important to use a mineral oil or vegetable oil to dilute the concentrate. Uh, gives us a little bit of sticking power, if you will, uh, to those uh, to those products. Uh, in order to to follow BQA recommendations, we don't want to use waste oil, motor oil, diesel fuel, those kind of things uh, in order to adhere to those BQA protocols. Uh, so a good rule of thumb, one gallon of mineral oil or vegetable oil per 15 to 20 feet of back rubber uh, is sufficient. Um, um, and uh, that'll, that'll help you with uh, some good effectiveness of that, uh, that back rubber. The challenge with any back rubbers or dust bags is that we have to place them uh, in areas where we're forcing use. So feeding areas, mineral feeding areas, watering areas, uh, we've got to force them into those areas in order for them to self-treat in an effective way. Um, uh, once we originally uh, treat those back rubbers, so um, uh, we can put those back rubbers down into an old uh, protein tub, an old watering tub, uh, in order to initially uh, get them uh, ready for use, and then we'll have to recharge those those oilers or back rubbers or dust bags every two to three weeks. Um, uh, so make sure that you follow that label direction there uh, in terms of how often you do need to recharge uh, those type products. Uh, so those ready to use formulations or pour on insecticides uh, is what we're talking about there. So whenever we apply those, we want to make sure that we're applying those between the withers and the tail head. Um, uh, for optimal control or optimal use of those products. Again, retreatment is going to have to be made in three to four week intervals, uh, especially whenever fly pressures are high. Uh, you also need to read on the label in terms of rain fastness. Uh, so some of those products will need to be on there for about 24 hours before they are considered rain fast. Um, uh, so it may be important for you to, as you read that label, to pay attention to what the weather's going to do. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of times that's just an educated guess, uh, but uh, uh, we do need to read that label and take that into consideration. Whenever we are using those pour on products, I cannot stress enough to you, don't overdose, underdose. Um, um, again, I say don't underdose. Uh, some a lot of times we don't have on farm scales. We don't uh, we don't have just a really good solid uh, number of what our cattle weigh, but uh, y'all are educated folks. Uh, you've been around the business. You have a, a pretty good idea of what your cattle weigh. Um, so anytime that we underdose those cattle, we get ineffective treatment, and that's when we start encouraging uh, pesticide resistance. So. Uh, follow the label direction of what it tells you to use in terms of that pour on product. Uh, don't try to cut corners there. Uh, provide the uh, the dose that it's telling you to use. Um, 
Uh, so those uh, those spray products out there uh, may be where you can use them as a livestock spray, an animal spray, and they can also be used as surface spray for any of those areas that you have uh, where particularly the stable fly may be resting. Uh, 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 so you might be able to use those products uh, in varying ways in terms of a livestock spray and a surface spray. Uh, and again, those organophosphates out there, just make sure that you read the label. Some of those products can cause some of that hypersensitivity in those Brahmin and Brahmin type cattle uh, or Brahmin influence cattle. So make sure that you follow the label related to those. So the IGRs and larvicides, um, big again, convenience factor similar to our, um, our insecticidal ear tags. Uh, so we know that we can get some uh, some pretty decent long term control out of those. Um, so some of the variables that are going to affect us in these feed through products. Um, so we are asking animals to self dose. Uh, so it's uh, it's important for us to make sure that uh, that they are receiving the correct dosage. Um, uh, and a lot of times with any time that we ask them to self medicate or self dose or self feed. Uh, we get uh, varying consistent or inconsistent intake. I'll put it that way. Um, so it's important for us to know and follow and keep good records to make sure that we are getting the correct dosing, uh, the correct intake of those products, whether that's through um, a mineral, uh, a block or whatever it is that we're trying to get that uh, those particular products in terms of IGRs and larvicides through. Uh, so the uh, the IGRs, those would be the diflubenzerons, which again, a lot of you may be familiar with that. Uh, we in terms of Demolin for army worm control, uh, that would be the Justify, the Clarify trade names, and then the Methoprene, um, uh, the Altacids, and then the Larvicides. Um, uh, that would be something like uh, Tetrachlorbenfos. The uh, trade name of that would be. Rayvon that you may see out there available as a larvicide. So as we move into the horn flies, the description of the horn fly, uh, they bite cattle, they feed on their blood, um, and we, they make it lose weight, uh, they make us not gain weight. Uh, so uh, I think it's important for us to have a good picture there to, uh, to just give a good description of what that fly looks like. Um, uh, so some um, uh, an easy way to tell that you have uh, horn flies is um, one caveat to that particular species is whenever they're resting on the cattle and they will rest so they will feed and rest on the animal. Uh, most of the time that whenever you look at those animals they'll be with uh, resting on the animal with their head facing towards the ground. Uh, so that's a quick caveat about that particular species that, uh, that will help us in terms of a proper identification. Uh, so the, uh, the horn fly maggots uh, develop under fresh uh, manure pat. So the fly lays the egg in the edge of the fresh manure pat. That's where that, uh, that maggot will develop. Uh, they prefer uh, those pastured cattle uh, in terms of manure pats. Um, uh, they seem to not prefer the manure pats of cattle that are on high energy concentrate diets. Uh, they like those manure pats of those pastured cattle eating grass. Um, uh, those females can lay up to 500 eggs uh, in that lifetime, so uh, we can get some very large populations built up over the summer pretty quickly. Uh, so the horn flies normally feed on the backs and sides of cattle, although they uh, they can be they can be observed um, uh, underneath the uh, the belly of the cattle up during the day. Uh, they don't like to get hot, so uh, they will move up underneath the uh, uh, the back or underneath the belly of the animal during the day. Um, uh, so the reason they got the the name horn flies because. Uh, they have been identified to congregate around the horns of cattle. Uh, so that's how they actually got the name horn fly. Um, uh, it's certainly challenging to count flies, but we do need to make sure that we uh, we have a good indicator of, uh, of, 
uh, what that uh, that economic threshold of 200 250 flies per side uh, again remember that uh, that pie plate rule of thumb so if you get a, um, a a congregate of flies resting on the cattle uh, and that group uh, that congregate group is about the size of a pie plate then you know that it's time to incorporate some uh, some some control measures uh, so again those horn flies like I said they do uh, stay on the animal almost continuously. Um, uh, they do rest with their heads pointing downward. Uh, during extreme hot weather, they will move to the underbellies. Uh, they seem to be um, uh, more attracted to dark hided cattle. Uh, they don't seem to be as, uh, as attracted to whiter cattle like Brahmin cattle or Charlet cattle. Uh, uh, they like those darker colored cattle and seem to be attracted to those um, and again, the uh, the importance of those uh, that flies is the weight loss uh, and related uh, decrease in weight gain that we can get uh, um, due to that particular uh, species of fly. Uh, so rotating pastures, dragging pastures, uh, trying to spread that manure in thin layers is uh, some of those non-chemical control measures. Um, chemical control measures, periodic uh, methods, um, and, and also ear tags, um, and those are those are very effective for us. Where we can get some of uh, those ear tags can provide us that long-term control, and some of those periodic methods can help us with short-term control, uh, three to four weeks of, of control, uh, especially whenever we get populations that uh, uh, that may blow up on us pretty quick. Um, uh, so those. Uh, um, sprays, pour on, self-treatment, uh, remote delivery. Uh, so when I'm talking about self-treatment, so that'll be those cattle oilers, uh, dust bags, uh, back rubbers, uh, all of those are what we're talking about in terms of self-treatment. So I will back up to that one real quick. So on the, the picture on the right, right there, that's, uh, that's what we're talking about in terms of those remote delivery capsules, the vet gun, uh, has uh, uh, has found its place in the industry for offering another uh, uh, tool in our tool belt for fly control. Um, and that's a uh, that's an indication of uh, uh, that spot on that red calf. There is an indication of what we get with that uh, uh, with that remote delivery capsule uh, whenever we're uh, applying that to the animal. So IGRs and larvicides can help us prevent horn fly larvae from developing into adults. Um, uh, so the immature horn flies, uh, the maggots are exposed to those chemicals in the manure pats uh, and uh, uh, prevents them from going through that life cycle. Um, uh, so the larvicides will be where we're actually killing the larva. Uh, the IGRs is where we're preventing uh, or providing that that chemical which ends up in the manure pat and it prevents that uh, that species from actually going through um, or developing into uh, the next stage of, uh, of that life cycle. So moving on into the stable fly. Uh, uh, so again, looks a lot like a house fly, smaller. It's about 3 sixteenths in, um, uh, in length. Uh, very painful um, uh, feeding. Uh, whenever they uh, whenever they're feeding on the animals or whenever they're feeding on you uh, they will feed on us as well um, uh, they do mainly feed on, uh, on cattle and horses uh, but they have been known to feed on small ruminants and also swine dogs and of course they feed on us as well uh, so on large animals cattle and horses they congregate around the legs uh, uh, you'll see cattle stomping a lot whenever they've got uh, a high population of stable flies. Uh, they'll move to the belly and lower sides when populations do get large, uh, large being greater than 25 flies per leg. Uh, on smaller animals, uh, uh, they tend to feed around the ears. Uh, so on those small ruminants, uh, they'll feed around the ears uh, and on the head and legs. Uh, anywhere where there's some superficial blood vessels. Um, and then just a side note on there for us, uh, you get those, a lot of times people call those biting flies, which would uh, 
very well be those stable flies. They'll feed on us around the legs, behind the knees, and also on the elbows. Uh, so like I said, these, uh, these stable flies, will, uh, they get on the legs of the animal. Uh, the, cattle, the cattle will stomp a lot. They'll bunch up in groups. Um, uh, unlike the horn flies that remain on the animal continuously, these stable flies will go and rest on nearby surfaces or vegetation. Uh, so a lot of times if we do have nearby surfaces, stall areas, barns, things like that, we can apply some residual surface sprays uh, that'll help us with, uh, with controlling uh, the stable fly. Uh, and again, as we said at the beginning, good sanitation practices are good, effective control measures for, uh, for stable fly control, getting rid of, dragging out those old hay feeding areas, uh, well, is one of the, uh, the things that we can do to help us there. Uh, they do congregate in those, those areas of decaying organic matter. Uh, economic threshold textbook tells us whenever we reach concentrations of 10 flies per animal. However, we do know that most often we will be exceeding that in Louisiana pastures. Uh, so anytime we get up into those large populations greater than 25 flies per leg, uh, we know that uh, uh, in between that, that 10 to 25, we know that we need to be thinking about uh, incorporating some control measures. Um, uh, so the reason they have an impact on cattle is because uh, uh, the animals become stressed and they spend less time feeding. So a lot of times whenever you see cattle uh, weighted out into a pond or a livestock, um, uh, watering uh, stock pond uh, and all they've got is a little part of their neck and their head sticking out of the water. Uh, uh, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times they're trying to get away from those, that faint, that painful feeding of that, uh, of that stable fly. Uh, so if they're spending more time standing in a watering hole or standing around fighting flies in a bunch, they're not out grazing and whenever they're not out grazing, uh, that's whenever it gets to be an economic issue for us. So larvicides, porons, insecticidal ear tags, um, uh, IGRs that are specifically designed for horn flies because the horn flies lay their eggs in the manure pats. Uh, those IGRs will not help us with stable flies. Uh, so uh, uh, the larvicides uh, will help us. Uh, those IGRs are not going to give us much control. Um, so anytime we start talking about those spray products, uh, uh, we don't have a, a really good long-term residual effect of those. So we know that they're going to have to be uh, reapplied every uh, two, three, four weeks, uh, depending on the product that you're using. Uh, uh, so they're going to have to be, be periodically reapplied in order to keep that, uh, that amount of effectiveness that you're, uh, you're seeking. And then we're going to move through these pretty quick. Uh, uh, the horse fly and the deer fly, uh, we know what those are. They feed on us, they feed on our livestock. Uh, uh, they are very difficult to control because um, uh, cattle are just a very small part of their life cycle. Uh, for the most part, they're independent of livestock. Uh, the adult female uh, depends on that livestock um, uh, for only just a few minutes uh, for that blood meal, and then they go somewhere else, uh, uh, branches overhanging water bodies and things like that to, uh, to, to lay their eggs. They don't lay their eggs in those old hay feeding areas. They don't lay their eggs in those manure pats. Uh, the rest of that life cycle is independent of, of livestock. So it gets to be pretty difficult for us to to have effective measures to uh, to control those uh, those pests, but uh, and there are some uh, some chemicals out there. Um, uh, just look for those that do contain that piperonyl butoxide. Uh, in terms of, of animal sprays, uh, they can provide a certain amount of repellency for you. Uh, those uh, synergists. Um, uh, do help with us the uh, help us with the effectiveness of those sprays whenever it comes to horse flies and deer flies. So another periodic pest that we do get 
Uh, the black fly, a lot of times we'll call them buffalo nets. Um, uh, they can be an issue for us in terms of uh, beef cattle. They can be an issue for us in terms of horses. Uh, they can be an issue for us in terms of backyard poultry. Um, uh, I probably get more calls on this particular pest in terms of backyard poultry and horses than anything. Um, and we're, we're lucky with those two animals that we can stall them or coop them during the day whenever this, uh, this fly uh, seems to be most active. Uh, that, uh, that does not uh, prove uh, an option for us in terms of beef cattle because it's uh, uh, we don't typically stall them during the day, uh, but we can do some things like uh, um, uh, burning, uh, burning old hay, uh, making some smoke out there, getting those cattle away from aquatic sources, which is where those uh, uh, those animals of that particular species of flock. Uh, they congregate and the majority of their life cycle is related to those uh, those areas of moving water. Uh, but we do see some uh, some areas around the country to where this black fly can uh, cause some major economic issues in terms of livestock losses, uh, just uh, um, in terms of death of livestock. Man, they are relentless uh, whenever they get into some heavy populations and uh, most of that, uh, those losses are related to suffocation of the animal. Uh, whenever they get, uh, whenever that fly gets into really, really heavy uh, populations, and and some of y'all that may be listening to this, you know what I'm talking about in terms of they're just relentless uh, uh, feeders, and uh, um, and they they can be a major issue for us in terms of those livestock deaths, not particularly related to. To weight losses, but we're actually losing animals because of those high populations. All right, so some uh, some management considerations as we start to wrap up. Um, it's important to understand that uh, anytime we're combating uh, these external parasites, uh, most times, especially in high population times during the summer, we've got to take a a multimodal approach. So. Uh, anytime we think we go out there and we, we put out uh, an IGR through a mineral mix or we put in ear tags, if we think that that's going to be a silver bullet one and done, um, um, a lot of times uh, that is uh, that may not be the case. We may have to uh, get out there and make a, uh, make a multimodal integrated pest management approach to, uh, to this uh, to this fly control that we're trying to achieve. Um, Y'all, there's a vast array of products out there. Um, and make sure that you read the label, make sure that you go back to the front of this presentation and understand the difference between um, uh, pyrethroids, the difference uh, related to organophosphates and microcytic lactones, all of those products that we use. So make sure that you're just knowledgeable of those products and understand how each one of those products works. Uh, also understand that uh, each one of those products may work for a specified amount of time. They're going to have, uh, they may have different ways that they can help you with, uh, with different stages of the life cycle and certainly they may be for certain targets. Uh, so make sure that you, uh, uh, you pay attention to those labels related to that. Um, uh, so, like I said, eliminating these pests at 100% may be unrealistic and close to impossible, uh, but whenever we do uh, co-mingle some of these, uh, some of these management options that we do have, uh, we can be 90-95% successful at controlling these fly pests. Uh, so incorporate that in integrated pest management plan, uh, combating these fly pests and, and trying to do the best that you can uh, a relative to economics um, uh, in order to control the, uh, the pests that are giving you the most economic damage. Uh, so one other thing I'll mention here, and I'm going to read some of this because I think if, if I mess up some of these numbers, it uh, may not have the same, same effect. So LSU Ag Center research shows that calves treated for uh, for internal parasite control, internal parasite control. So we're giving those calves a dewormer. 
And those dams who were treated for horn flies were approximately 23 pounds heavier than untreated calves and dams at, uh, at Weenie. So related to present day economics. So if a 550 pound steer is valued at $1.36, uh, 23 pounds of added weight equates to $26.33. So if we spend an extra $5 a head for insecticidal tags, so that would be a tag in each year in that mature cow, about $5 a head. And then we treat that uh, those calves for internal parasites and black leg uh, vaccine, we're gonna spend an additional $2.30 a head on the calves. So with that additional $5 a head on the, cat, on the cow, $2.30 a head on the calf, we're still in the profit of $24 a head, uh, just in the added weight gain that we're gonna get in those calves. So I know it looks like that we're spending a little bit of extra money in times whenever money is pretty tight, but whenever we actually look at it in terms of uh, adding value to the calf in terms of additional weight gain, we can show that uh, uh, that we can get some profit out there, profitability out there in those calves. Uh, so one of the things, just a couple of other caveats, uh, we realize that there are some additional flies out there that may, uh, may cause us some issues. Uh, one of those being face flies. Uh, so face flies are those flies that are not biting, they're not blood sucking. Uh, they're feeding on the, uh, the facial secretions around the nose and the eyes. Uh, so a lot of times we can get some pretty effective control of those with some insecticidal ear tags. Uh, oilers and back rubbers also have a good bit of effectiveness for controlling face flies because the cattle want to butt on those things. They want to butt on the back rubbers. Uh, they want to butt on those, those oilers. Uh, so they get those, those products on their face, uh, which will help us in controlling face flies. Uh, the importance of controlling those face flies is because uh, those uh, those flies do transmit pink eye, uh, so uh, uh, we've got to uh, we got to take that in consideration. Uh, if we do have a history of pink eye on the farm, uh, we definitely may want to uh, make sure that we're controlling uh, those face flies. So with that being said, I'm going to shut up now and turn it over to. Uh, Ashley, and we'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Jason. Uh, I only see one question on here. That is, can my neighbor's herd make my efforts in vain if he or she does not exercise fly control? Does distance matter? So it sounds like this producer is utilizing fly control, but their um, neighbor is not. So does that impact you know, their efforts towards their own fly control. So if we're talking about horn flies, um, it, it's stable flies too, so yes, proximity is going to matter, uh, but is it, uh, is it all in vain? No, so what I would do is look to incorporating specifically uh, for horn flies, I would look at incorporating an IGR uh, that, uh, uh, that could help you uh, in terms of some of, of controlling some of those um, non-domiciled fly populations, if you will, or even a larvicide uh, that, uh, that could help you in terms of some of those stable flies. So yes, proximity does come into play uh, and we can't, uh, we can't always direct what our neighbors are doing, but uh, if we incorporate some of those larvicides and IGRs, it could help us with some of those non-domicile populations. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna make a note while Jason's on this slide right now. You can follow us on YouTube. That is LSU Ag Center dash livestock. So you can see that there. Uh, in, in the image on the right hand side. We do post our webinars there. Uh, it takes a couple of days to get that up onto YouTube. And we have also started doing bi-weekly news updates. And so if you subscribe, you get automatic email notifications when those videos get posted. 
You can also see Jason's contact information there. So uh, if you come up with questions uh, in the future, you can contact him or if you're watching this on YouTube and not watching it live, then you can also send him an email or contact him with any of those questions. Jason, can you please swap it to the next slide? Okay, so we ask that you please take three or so minutes to complete the survey on our webinars. Um, the way to do this is to open the camera on your phone and you can view that QR code there on the camera. Um, I have an iPhone. I'm assuming it's going to work the same way with an Android, but basically I get four little yellow corners around the QR code and a little banner comes up at the top. I can click on that to go to the webinar. So it'll open in my Safari or whatever your browser is on an Android and you can um, complete the survey there. I'm also going to post the link to the survey now in the Q&A. So if you are watching this live, um, that link that I just posted in the Q&A will send, it, send you to that survey. Um, again, it takes about three minutes and these are essential for us to, to be able to continue these webinars in the future. Um, Vince, do you see any other questions that I missed anywhere? No, I, no, uh, no, I do not. OK, thank you. So with that, we're going to thank you again for joining us on our Beef Brunch webinar this morning. Um, just again, we are going to post these online. It will take a couple of days, but you can go to LSU Ag Center dash livestock on YouTube to be able to view these. Our next Beef Brunch webinar will be at 1030 AM on Tuesday, June 9th. We will have Dr. Ron Strahan discussing management of weeds in summer pastures. We will post a flyer and email that out with the link and all information to access that uh, as the event approaches. Lastly, if you have any questions regarding the Beef Brunch educational series, please feel free to contact me. My email is akedwards at agcenter.lsu.edu or you can reach me at 512-818-5476. Thank you all and have a great day.